There is definitely a large culture around discovering bad movies. Every film buff wants to discover the next great bad movie. How Sweet It Is, from the year 2013, is a very unique kind of bad movie. First give me 50 bucks so I can buy crack. Ooh. I was confused, I was stunned, and at points I was horrified even though this is supposed to be a musical comedy. The movie How Sweet It Is, from the year 2013, stars former Saturday Night Live star Joe Piscopo. It also stars Paul Servino. This incredibly talented actor is wasted on this material. You looked in my eyes, you lied to me. You treated me like a fucking jerk. Like I was never nothing to you. Paul Servino is an award-winning actor, best known for his roles in films like Goodfellas, The Rocketeer, Dick Tracy, Cruising, and many more good parts. There are actors in this movie that have starred in many other good things. Their collective talent is wasted on a story that barely makes any sense. For the first time in a long time, I don't have an urge to drive into oncoming traffic. <laughs> Joe Piscopo was most famous in the 80s for his impression work he would do on Saturday Night Live. He left SNL in 1984 and went on to have a short movie career, starring in films like Dead Heat. Detective Bigelow is bringing him back alive. We have something on the monitor, Captain. What is this thing? Very ugly. Get down! That's it. From now on, I'm a vegetarian. Joe Piscopo, our dead heat. A maturing Joe Piscopo left Saturday Night Live to conquer Hollywood. There are so many digs at Joe Piscopo in The Simpsons. He was actually known in the 80s. A young Joe Piscopo taught us how to laugh. The Simpsons makes fun of him because he is a cliche of a person who wants to be the big leading man in Hollywood. Who is Joe Piscopo? In 1997, he married Kimberly O'Driscoll and sang her a love song on live television for all of us to enjoy. The song is called Kimberly. I get it, her name is Kimberly. How many times are we going to say her name? Kimberly, Kimberly. Yes, that is Kimberly. Kimberly. They say it's all wrong. We know it's all right. They say it's all wrong. You know, it's all right. Cover me! Three, four! What was that? Three, four! Three, four. Three, four. Three, four. After more than a decade of trying to stay relevant, Joe Piscopo finally released a comedy special. He had apparently opened a nightclub in Atlantic City, New Jersey, called Club Piscopo. I'd like to thank you, my friends, for being here at the show. I'm your humble entertainer, Joe Piscopo. He does the impression work he's most famous for, such as David Letterman. He tells stories about his times on SNL and just name drops a bunch of people. Do you know, my dear friends, I am proud to stand before you to tell you I went on to become a friend of the great James Brown. These are some of the incredibly talented people he mentioned he was friends with. Michael Keaton, who he refers to as Mike Keaton, Danny DeVito, Jay-Z, and of course, Frank Sinatra, who he mentions about 1,000 times in this routine. Frank Sinatra, the chairman of the board, old blue eyes, Francis. Albert Sinatra. Or Frank Sinatra? Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra was Mr. Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. On top of being a talented actor and impressionist, Joe Piscopo is a musician. Throughout the rest of the special, he does a variety of musical acts. Although he couldn't get rights clearances to any real songs for the special, so he just performs public domain songs like Old MacDonald Had a Farm. E -I -E -I -O. All the cats came from miles around. <laughs> from miles around. And then there was one film I did where Treat Williams and I played cops where that died and came back to life called Dead Heat, and unfortunately that's what happened to the film. I was like in Japan, and I swear to God, at a customs, and the guy's going, oh, dead heat, dead heat, you'll die, you come back to life. I go, wow, that joke didn't land. 
You also get to hear Joe Piscopo rap. I'm rapping facts, Joe Piscopo. I was born a white boy, but I like to rap black. Rapping best, Piscopo. Music is supposed to be pleasant to listen to. Are we a bunch of funky hunkies or what? Did we get jiggy with it? Why is he facing away from everyone? For shizzle, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> For shizzle. Throughout this spectacular extravaganza of talent, Joe plays quite a few instruments. Saxophone, the guitar, the piano, drums. And the flute. We love you, we appreciate it very much, and we'll see you next time. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Get the fuck out of there. Take a drink, please. Let us now get into the main subject matter, how sweet it is, baby. Please give me 50 bucks so I can buy crack. It's been a while since I covered a really bad, obscure movie, and I thought this movie, How Sweet It Is, was the perfect material. Come here. I find the washed up Joe Piscopo character endlessly fascinating. He takes a lot of pride in being an Italian American, and so in this musical they have to cram in a bunch of references to Italian things. The story just doesn't make any sense. Joe Piscopo plays a man named Jack Cosmo, who is a washed up theater director trying to make his last great show to pay off a debt he owes to some gangsters. Jack Cosmo? What kind of stupid name is that? Jack Cosmo. Hey, just grab some breakfast, go back to my place. I, I, I just... Jack Cosmo! Uh, I, I'm sorry, is there something that you're trying to tell me? Just look at the title card. It looks like it's for a failed Nickelodeon cartoon. There is a short little song over the opening credits. Jack Cosmo is hanging out in an alleyway, and he is approached by two gentlemen. It's implied that these two gentlemen are gay, which is cool, that's fine and all, but it seems like just from their dialogue, they're trying to have some kind of exchange for sexual favors, if you know what I mean. 20 to see it, 50 to touch. That's supposed to be the joke of this scene, is that he's prostituting himself, or so you think. When they get to his apartment and he reaches into his pocket, you think he's gonna pull out his schlong, but he just pulls out a key to a trophy case behind him. This movie is like an endurance test. A second later, there's a knock on the door. It's three gangsters sent by Paul Servino. They punch him in the face. Then with the door wide open, this gangster puts a silencer on his gun. It's, it's such a tiny silencer. Then he fake kicks this guy in the nuts and jumps out the window. Just a horrible set, music choices. Just listen to the music at this part. <laughs> It turns out Paul Servino's character is a huge fan of musical theater, and he wants Jack Cosmo to write a stage production for him, otherwise he's going to kill him. It's his last chance to write a great musical for everyone to love, and for him to be in the spotlight once again. Oh my, the subtext. It's astonishing. Where did you go? I mean, it's been 10 years, right, since the last production? Show business makes what you do for a living seem like daycare. Another issue with the scene is that it goes on for way too long, and the only purpose it serves is to establish this character and that Jack Cosmo owes him a bunch of money. I still commend Paul Servino's effort and him trying to elevate this material that is total dog shit. You know what we're gonna call it? How sweet it is! Like candy. Exactly! <laughs> that is wonderful. You think? Yeah. Do I think, guys? It's just not a great idea. Everybody loves stories about candy. I love Skittles. I'm glad you like it. I do. Because I want you to make it. I, I, I'm sorry? Yeah, you're gonna produce and write and direct my show. This is gonna be your comeback. I'm gonna finance it myself. Well, where are we gonna stage this thing? I just took a strip club off a woman who couldn't pay me back the money I lent her for her husband's penile surgery. He should already be working on the show, but instead we're slogging through this scene. Paul Servino's in a wheelchair, but then he just gets up. He's like, oh, I was just kidding. I got that wheelchair off a cripple who owed me a bunch of money or something like that. There's a scene with Paul Servino later. He's eating a bunch of spaghetti and he gets some sauce in his suit. And he says, this isn't the kind of suit I wear on this day when I'm eating this kind of spaghetti. Another character who takes too long to set up is this F. FBI agent. His name is Ethan Trimble, and to get to the Mafia, they're going to plant this FBI agent undercover in Jack Cosmo's new theater production. 
He knows who Jack Cosmo is. Ten years ago, this guy was huge. So what? Ten years ago, my wife didn't look like her mother. This joke is also in the trailer, even though they use a different angle. Ten years ago, my wife didn't look like her mother. My wife didn't look like her mother. Wife didn't look like her mother. Hey, how do you even know about this guy? Minor to musical theater in college. Really? What did you major in? Crying in the shower? <laughs> Jack Cosmo is auditioning a bunch of people for his show. The entire joke of this audition sequence is that every single person who auditions is bad. This person's issue is that he's a crack addict. Please give me 50 bucks so I can buy crack. That would be a very, very, very good choice. Yes, it would. A choir starts singing in the middle of his number, even though there's no choir present in the scene. Due to copyright, I cannot play the entire song. I can, however, read you the lyrics. So here are the lyrics to first give me 50 bucks so I can buy crack. You cannot find the lyrics anywhere because this is not a real song that has been heard by lots of people. I had to view the movie and write down the lyrics for you. My name is Clifton and I live down the block. I used to have a house, but now I have a box. I may be in debt, but I'll pay it back. But first give me 50 bucks so I can buy crack. Ooh. That would be a very, very, very nice thing for you to do because my insides are beginning to sting and it hurts when the other junkies laugh at me because I got my drugs from a crime family. 50 bucks will do the trick. I don't like this musical number. We can move on and I'll never mention it again. A character by the name of Christina auditions and she seems to do a good job, except she has anger issues. I am the boss of you. The scene has to reference back to the future for no reason. They found me. I don't know how, but they found me. Oh my god, they found me. I don't know how, but they found me. What the fuck? Why was that in the movie? Run for it, Marty! Run for it! What does this have to do with Back to the Future? Is there some kind of obscure Italian-American symbolism in Back to the Future that made them want to reference it in this movie? Then the FBI mole auditions, and he actually does a pretty good job. Jack Cosmo already takes a liking to him. Getting the show together is a disaster. Joe constantly drinks, the songs suck. Ethan wants the show to go on because if there's no show, then they can't catch the mafia. That's the logic of the plot. They're going to arrest the mafia at the show. So Ethan and the FBI hunt down Jack Cosmo's daughter. We're introduced to her doing aerobics with her cleavage out. Wow, look at that heat signature. She's hot. She opens the door. He stares right down at her breasts. One, two. Hi. This is a great start to their relationship. Their interactions are so corny. Everyone deserves a second chance. Second, try again. Third. Higher. Okay, he's really trying. And it's so obvious where the relationship is going to go. With the help of Sarah Cosmo, Jack Cosmo is able to get back on his feet, stop drinking, and write a great show. Ethan delivers coffee in this one part, and he thinks the coffee's expensive, so he's like, are you gonna spot me some cash? To which they say, this is just part of show business, kid. And then they sing a whole song about it. Wonder how I ever got we didn't need a whole song about this shit. And the number itself is just fucking horrible. Welcome to showbiz, you cuckoo kid. The climax of the movie is basically just the show. Before the show even starts, Ethan tells Jack and Sarah that he's an FBI plant, to which they have like a eh reaction. You lied to me? Yes. Yes, you can get mad at me later. Don't tell me what I can get mad at you. Look, 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 I'm trying to make this right. Look, 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 that's our agent. I need you to find a way to get that guy away from Big Mike for the rest of the show. And you can't let that guy, that guy, oh, and especially that guy get suspicious of what you're doing. This FBI agent acts so suspicious the entire show. He keeps talking into his sleeve. Ethan. Ethan. That's the most suspicious action you could do. <laughs> the show itself is supposed to be a metaphor for Jack Cosmo's inner struggles. But what is Jack Cosmo learning from any of this? I prefer Night of Club Piscopo. I loved when he was rapping. Boom, cha boom, cha boom, cha boom. I'm Mr. Clown, and I'm here to say. Ethan has a scene with Christina. Jack Cosmo gives her a thumbtack to press against her skin which will apparently calm her down. She has a thumbtack around her neck and she presses it into her boob. This is great. 
That was a lot of setup for a lame joke. Just describing all of that gives me the urge to walk into oncoming traffic. I regret ever seeing this film. There are five songs in this movie that we see performed. The opening, which doesn't really count because it's just over the opening credits. The crack number, the welcome to showbiz kids song, and the final show has two songs in it. These songs are horrendous. To blow your mind. The choreography is really bad. Why the fuck do they have their asses in the air? The FBI try arresting Paul Servino in the middle of the show. And you're under arrest. Pop, we gotta get out of here. No, I've been set up by him back there. Everybody out of here! Oh no. This is why it was a bad idea to arrest him in such a public setting. You gave me my life back, man. Please, don't take it away. So they arrest Paul Servino, and even though he was about to kill everyone and the entire audience left, they decide to put on one final musical number just for Jack Cosmo to enjoy. And he is brought to tears by seeing the beauty of his vision come to life. How sweet it is. By the end of the film, I felt as if nothing was accomplished, and that's perhaps my biggest criticism of the entire thing. No one learned anything. What the hell was the point of this movie, even? A few of his cast members got together. Jack Cosmo wrote One Last Great Play. It seems like a light-hearted family film for most of it, but then there's all this fucking bizarre humor. This comes off as an ego project for Joe Piscopo, something that's kind of supposed to put him back in the spotlight. Ironically, kind of like Jack Cosmo. But the fact of the matter is, this is a very obscure movie. When I first saw the movie and I checked the ratings online, there were like 40 ratings. So let's read some of the reviews that How Sweet It Is got. I bet these are going to be a lot of fun. My mom wanted to watch this because it was billed as a musical. It's not. And the musical numbers that there are in the movie are kind of in the context of an audition or a show. Just like this review says, the rest of the numbers stem from auditions, and in scenes from the play, Cosmo ultimately writes how sweet it is. That's me, baby. Every single character in this movie is a cartoon. The supporting characters in this movie are not resolved that well. For example, Clifton the crackhead. He is trying to get over the memory of his dead mother's mole, which is why he smokes so much crack. There's a scene where one of the gangsters dresses up as a mole, and he confronts his inner demons having to do something with the mole. You've been smoking too much crack, you gotta stop. Clifton basically just gets off crack. Just as long as the party tonight does not include any crack. Oh. Hello, I gotta take this go for Clifton. He seems to actually be doing very well for himself. Unfortunately, during the show, one of the performers has a giant mole, which scares the shit out of him, and now he's most likely back on crack again. Every other character serves little to no purpose, aside from making lame jokes. The last we see of the FBI and the Mafia, they just walk off and go to jail. Not that I wanted more than that. That would mean the movie would be longer. If there's one saving grace of how sweet it is, it's that the runtime is really short. I couldn't help but find parallels between Jack Cosmo and Joe Piscopo. Joe Piscopo, with a Hollywood career behind him, was hoping to make a comeback with this unfunny, ugly looking film. I burn inside for you. I burn inside for you. We're gonna make it, girl. And Joe got divorced in 2006. You can find the Kimberly clip online. It's called Prepare to Cringe. <laughs> Joe Piscopo sings Kimberly or something like that. <laughs> what really sparked my interest recently was I saw a documentary with him in it. He makes a short cameo and he's dancing. Go Joe, go Joe. Yeah.